Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Loreen Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. I'm happy to welcome back to this table Martha Burke. Welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, this is a particularly timing, time, timely time to have you. We have so much to talk about. Let me give a little about your background. You're called a political psychologist, author, women's equity expert. You're the money editor of Ms. Magazine, plus you right. co-founded Ms. Magazine. You blog for Huffington Post. You're always on TV as an expert. You have a radio show called Equal Time. So thank you for giving us some of that time. Well, I'm delighted to do that. Well, you did catapult yourself into the national stage. Was it in 2003? Yes. Tell us what you were doing that year. I was running the National Council of Women's Organizations, which is the nation's largest coalition of women's groups. So any group you know about from Church Women United to Planned Parenthood were our members, National Organization for Women, American Association of University Women, and on and on. We represented 10 million women. And I learned that this little golf club down in Augusta, Georgia, did not allow women as members. So I suggested to my board that we write them a letter and say, and, let women in. And what is that little sports event that that little That's golf club That's the Masters does? Golf Tournament. The Masters. Most famous uh, tournament in the world, really. And so I said, why don't we write them a letter and tell them we think they should open to women? And so they said, fine, we don't even need a vote on that. Just do it. So I wrote them a letter, and they went ballistic. They sent a press release out to the entire sports world press saying we had them at the point of a bayonet, and women had sewing circles, so why couldn't they just stay in sewing circles? And it caused a media firestorm that lasted over a year, culminating in a, in a, a protest at the Masters Tournament during which they put us in a muddy field one half mile from the front gates and told us that they took a restraining order and said, if you step out of this field, we're going to arrest you. And so these were a troop of Amazons you hired to protest, or were they <laughs> women much as they yourself? Were Not women. quite a You threat. know, most of us were grandmothers, some parents, and a few college students. Uh, and we did have some men there, but we actually, they surrounded us with police. We had more police than protesters. We were not successful. They did not open the club that year. So we decided to take another tack, and we drug through the courts for seven or eight years, almost a decade. We sued two of the companies whose CEOs were members of the club because it was a business venue. Mm -hmm. That's what it was all about, access to the inner circle of very high-level business. It was all Fortune 500 CEOs. So we brought two lawsuits in behalf of women that worked for those companies, collected $80 million, got a judgment that they could no longer entertain at or in conjunction with any venue that discriminates against women. At that point, these boys still wanted to play golf, so they decided they better let women in. And that's how it came about. Well, congratulations. I followed that long before I knew you. I, I was watching how that turned out. And then was your book Cult of Power, Sex, Discrimination, in Corporate America, was that? It was a story of that fight, uh, sex discrimination in corporate America and what can be done about it. And it's really a fascinating story. You can still get it as an e-book. And uh, just to know the dirty tricks that happened. At uh, one point I had to get a bulletproof vest. Many death threats. Over golf, yes. Wow. Wow. Well, um, your other book that I love, uh, I actually, this well-thumbed copy of it, it's called Your Voice, Your Vote, and what is the subtitle? Title? The Savvy Woman's Guide to Power, Politics, and the Change We Need. And we do need change, but 
uh, because you are the money editor at Mid Ms. Magazine, I would like you to take a little time to educate me and our audience about some of the statistics about women. And um, I think just in the last couple of days, there's been a release by the National Women's Law Center of the statistics for 2013. Can you refresh us a little bit? How are women doing? Women aren't doing so hot. Uh, the statistics, uh, National Women's Law Center did a press release on the statistics that actually came from the U.S. Census Bureau. Mm. And what there, it was on poverty, uh, the poverty numbers. And what really struck me about it, it was reported on the evening news as the poverty rate in the United States has gone down for the first time in five years since the recession. Uh, the poverty rate has gone down, and I thought, hmm, I wonder about that. Well, the next morning, I got in the email the Law Center's analysis. Yeah, the poverty rate went down, but not for women. Oh. Women have not moved in the po We're still 14.5% of women in this whole country are living in poverty, and more than that in New Mexico. Nationally, 19% of our kids are living in poverty. The number in New Mexico is 29%. Oh, no. So we are not doing so well. And even though the poverty rate went down overall, it's still much higher than it was a decade ago. So the news reports are a bit misleading. Uh, women of color, of course, of we have so many, Hispanic women particularly, Native American women in this state, they are higher percentage in poverty than women overall, and certainly than white women. So the news is not all that good for well, us. Well, let's talk a little about the wage gap. But say a, 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 an Anglo woman working a full-time job year-round earns what percentage of the salary that would be paid to a male counterpart? To be exactly precise, 77.8%. So okay. there is a 22 cents on the dollar gap full-time year-round workers. Because often, Lorene, you know, we hear, oh, well, women work part-time or they drop out of the workforce or whatever. No, this is full-time year-round workers. And our pay gap in New Mexico is pretty consistent with that national number. We fall about in the middle uh, if you rank the states on the pay gap, uh, we do better on the pay gap than we do on something like child poverty. We're number one. How you like that? And yeah. we're number one in teen pregnancy. Mm. So we have a lot of work to do in this state. Let's just visit briefly the uh, wage gap between a, a black woman, for example, and Hispanic women. And you say they don't even really calculate Native American women. They haven't calculated Nav Native American women in several years. But right now it's 63 cents on the dollar for African American women, 54 cents for Hispanic women. Uh, no, 56. They came up just a little bit this year. It's still a little more than half a little more of what than a man half. gets paid. And the last number we had for Native American women was 54 cents, and that's been about four to five years ago. But keep in mind the wage gap between women and men overall has not moved in a decade. Mm. And the Institute for Women's Policy Research just this week did an analysis of how long it's going to take us to close that pay gap at at the rate we're going. It's 45 years. That is a career in anybody's book. It's really more than a career. So for the young women out there that are watching this show, I just want to say get out there and vote because you've got to vote for somebody that has your interests in mind. Don't think just because you can get hired and women are in all the professions and so forth that it ain't going to happen to you because it will. Even, Loreen, jobs that are dominated by ma uh, women, such as teaching and nursing, the men in those fields make more. Uh. So we have a long way to go, and that's why I, one of my crusades is getting women to vote. Uh, women can control any election. 
Women are the majority in the population. We're the majority of registered voters, and we are the majority of those who actually show up and vote. So if women get together, vote their own interests, and by the way, polls show that women, 80% of the women agree on 80% of the issues. Well, let's look at how do women feel about some of the major issues, and this is not partisan. This is just women in general polled. How do they feel about some of the major issues? What what numbers do we have? Well, women are pretty much together on uh, a lot of things. Let's take some that's been in the news very recently because of the Hobby Lobby Supreme Court mm -hmm. decision, and that's birth control. Women believe birth control should be legal, accessible, uh, and affordable. And so conservative forces believe that they should not have access to birth control if their employer's religion uh, doesn't believe in it, never mind about your own religious yeah. beliefs as an employee. So women believe that birth control should be legal. And to have an attack on birth control is a big surprise to a lot of younger women uh, because they never thought that would happen. I never thought it would happen. Yeah. You know, we fought this battle 30 years ago. 35 years ago. Now we're back. Uh, most women believe abortion should be legal. Women and men disagree some on what kinds of restrictions there might be out there, such as how late term you could have an abortion. Uh, but they all, or up to 87, 88 percent of the people, think abortion should be legal. So when you see this stuff in the media that sounds like there's really a lot of disagreement, there's no disagreement on that score. Um, um, women yes, want tell social me security. Yeah. Uh, women don't want it to go away. They don't want it to be privatized. Women have less social security. You know, we're 75% of the elderly in poverty or guess what, female. Mm -hmm. So women need that. They want it. It lasts as long as they do. You can't out, you know, you can't run out yeah. of Social Security. And if it is privatized, as many conservatives would like it to be, what if your investment manager doesn't invest so well? Well, there was a big push to privatize Social Security right before 2008 when the, quote, recession, unquote, hit. Yes. And there would be so many more people in poverty as a result of that, if, if that had not been s securely managed the well, way it was absolutely. by the Well, absolutely. And if you privatize it, so it's up to the big banks, uh, you know, how they invest your money. You trust them? Well, maybe. But uh, you could get a Bernie Madoff for mm -hmm. an investment manager. And mm -hmm. then what would happen? And the other thing, Loreen, quite seriously, is that women's accounts would be so much smaller than what the investment big boys want to deal with, you probably couldn't even find anybody to invest it for you anyway. So then you're sticking it under the mattress and losing money every year. There's so many contemporary issues. I mean, this very week, there was a vote in the Senate, the United States Senate, on pay equity again. So it failed to pass. So tell us what the plan is. Well. The plan, I think, for Obama, as it was for Bill Richardson in this state when he was governor, and he did it, is to take some measures for pay equity that don't require a vote in the Congress. You can do a lot by executive order. President Obama has recently uh, done an executive order for federal contractors that says you can't fire an employee for discussing their pay with other employees mm. because a lot of workplaces make you sign an agreement that you won't discuss your pay, and if you do, you can be fired. So he put a stop to that with federal contractors. One of our biggest headaches in pay equity is women can't find out how they're being paid compared to the men. Well, in this state, Bill Richardson put in a, an executive order that said if you want a contract with the state, you have to tell us how you're paying women and how you're paying men. It is still in force. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not uh, being robustly pursued in the current administration, 
but we do have that, and we were the first in the nation. The city of Albuquerque, as we speak, is working on it to be the first city in the country. So it's our tax dollars, Lorene. We have a right to know. Are we giving our tax dollars to companies that are fair to women and men equally? Well, one of my heroes is Le Lily Ledbetter, and the first bill that Obama passed was the Ledbetter Fair Wage Act, and the only way she knew, she was a manager of a Goodyear tire place, she received a scrap of paper on which was written her salary to the penny and the other three male managers that had the same status, mm -hmm. and she was getting paid something like 40% less, and she fought all the way to the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court, however, uh, because of the statute of limitations, et cetera, uh, she did, was, did not receive justice. But Ruth Bader Ginsburg said to the Congress, the ball is in your court. You've got to change this law. The statute of limitations has to be maybe 180 days after you learn about it, right. not after it happened. For 20 years, she'd been paying. She didn't know. Yeah. So it was a catch-22. The court said, the Roberts Court, I will uh, repeat, said... Uh, even if you don't know about it, you still have to complain within 120 days or you lose your right to complain. But I want to stress that Ledbetter, the case uh, and the act that Obama signed, it was the first act he signed when he got into office, it only got us back, Lorene, to where we had been before that court decision. Uh. It did not move the ball further down the court at mm -hmm. all. Uh, it just it just got us back. They, see, they overturned 40 years of precedent in that case. Mm. It just got us back to where we were 40 mm. years ago. So we need that Paycheck Fairness Act that the Senate, actually the, the Republicans, the conservatives, filibustered the bill this week, uh, and it didn't even come up for a vote, much less passed. And yet that's the issue that women say is the most important, is right. pay Right, it equity. polls number one. We have so many other issues we have to move along. Minimum wage. Is it not, do not most women and most people support raising the minimum yes, wage? Yes. And, there, there and how was, would that affect women? Oh, it would be tremendous. You know what percentage of minimum wage workers are adult women? 75%. Oh, no. People think, they. you hear this all the time, oh, it's just teenagers, they're working for gas money, uh, tattoo money, nose ring money, yeah. whatever. Uh, it's not, oh, and it's an entry-level job so teenagers can learn to work. No. You look when you go in a fast food place or some place that has people cleaning the floors and so forth, uh, who are they? They are adult women mostly. So in this state, uh, two-thirds of the people support a raise in the minimum wage to at least ten dollars and some a little bit even higher they just did a poll the albuquerque journal just did a poll on that and it cuts across party lines so now the democratic people who identified as democrats were slightly more supportive than those who identified as republicans but i think it's significant that regardless of race gender ethnicity age or party affiliation, people support a raise in the minimum wage. If you think about that as a women's issue, which it very much is, uh, that would do, especially in a high poverty state like this, it would do a lot to lift some people out of poverty. Right now it's so low you can work a minimum wage job and still be on food stamps, uh, still be on Medicaid, and some employers even teach you how to do that mm, yeah. because they don't want to raise the wages. I just think the people watching this program need to start thinking of a low minimum wage as a corporate subsidy mm -hmm. because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. You're underwriting the corporation every time you have to provide food stamps, subsidized child care, all of those kind of public services. The taxpayers are paying for that because the corporations won't pay a fair wage. Well, we're speaking today with Martha Burke, who is the money editor of Viz Magazine. And as we discuss this, I'm just so um, compelled to realize how much economic and gender issues are, are intertwined. And in your book, Your Voice, Your Vote, The Savvy Women's Guide to Power Politics and the Change We Need, 
you're talking about what we can do. So how do the how do women in general view the parties? Oh, the women in general. Uh, there's a saying now: women are Democrats, men are Republicans. Uh. Uh, because I looked at the data just very recently, and it's actually in the book as well, that women have been leaving the Republican Party since 1973. But the real watershed year was 1980 when Ronald Reagan was elected because the federal Equal Rights Amendment was before the states, and Reagan came out against the mm. Equal Rights Amendment and the Republicans took it out of their platform for the first time in 40 years. They had, been, they had put it in their platform first, and it had been in since 1940. In 1980, they took it out, and it's never been in there again. So this is really kind of funny. About a month ago, two Republican organizations, um, they, they commissioned two polls to see how, what women thought about their party. And they thought it was old, outdated, and too male. And this was a Republican pollster, so that's kind of bad news. Uh, so women have been leaving the Republicans. Now, have they all gone to the Democrats? No. Both women and men in the last 12 years have moved more into the independent column. Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, women more often will vote with, with the Democrats, even if they in, identify as independent. But both parties have lost to, the, to that independent group. With the gridlock in Congress, you can pretty much see why. Yeah. And uh, the, the tug of war between progressive ideas and conservative ideas, it's, it's, it's really there. One of the mysteries is, because some of the things like the Hobby Lobby decision were really shocking to women. You know, the, the, there was such disrespect, and um, some of the invasive procedures to oh, do yes. with pregnancy termination, the mandatory ultrasounds and things. This is medieval. This is dark ages stuff, and yet it, there's a pattern many times of people voting against their own interests. Well, I just read this week, and uh, another thing that's helped many, many women uh, is the Affordable Care Act because a lot of women were working part-time. They couldn't get employer insurance, uh, so they now can get insurance. But when they interviewed women and men who were in that, that situation, they have insurance now, but they didn't have it before, and yes, they can afford it because some of them are getting subsidies, low-wage workers. They still said they were going to vote against President Obama. It doesn't make any sense. And what I tell women, particularly, and men that care about women, vote your own interest. And I have women, because of the way we're socialized, Laureen, they come up and say, well, isn't that selfish, you know, to vote your own interest? I mean, isn't that selfish? Who else is going to do it? And I it? say, you think the 1% votes their own interest? Yeah. How about the gun lobby? Do they vote their own interest? And so we have to start thinking about that. And let me just tell you that gun control is a place where there are big gender gaps in how people feel about it. Uh, hardly anybody wants guns to be completely illegal, but women want many more restrictions than men do. And I use this example because I think it's pretty salient. Men think of gun control as hunting, or somebody might call me to come clean up Dodge. Yeah. Women think of gun control as my kid getting shot at school, Absolutely. getting raped at gunpoint. It is a very different thing when you look at it through a gender lens. And so it, not only in party affiliation is there a gender gap, but in issues. Women are much more tolerant mm -hmm. of gay rights, gay marriage, gay adoption, have been for 15 years. So as I listen to you, you really make me aware that there are a lot of hidden issues in agenda, that there's another substrata going on here. So tell me about some other ones that we might not notice. What, what, what do we need to be aware of? Well, we need to be aware of who we're voting for because who we send to Congress matters, and it matters by gender. Now, I'm not going to say there aren't conservative women because there are, but if you look at some very important votes, and you mentioned abortion, we've been talking about the Affordable Care Act, you cannot get an abortion 
under the Affordable Care Act. It, they left it out. Why did they leave it out? There was a thing called the Stupac Amendment that did that. You look at that vote, virtually 100% of the women, regardless of party, voted against that amendment. They wanted abortion to be covered. 100% of the men almost mm. went with don't cover it, regardless of party. So there's a big gender gap there. Why didn't the women prevail? Not enough women in Congress. We've got 17%. Uh, if we don't get up to 50%, probably the Fair Pay Act wouldn't have passed if the women in the Senate hadn't really jawboned the men. It's just not that important to them. Yeah. So yeah. we need more women in Congress. That's People think, well, I don't think much about Washington. I just think about my own state. We have a lot of poverty here. The U.S. Congress just cut food stamps. That comes down to your state, even if you think you don't think about national politics. So, Well, Martha Burke, we've got 30 seconds. Can you give a clarion call? Why people, and a lot of people are discouraged about how things are going politically, why they should go and vote in this election. Because if you're discouraged now and you don't go vote, believe me, the conservative forces that want to put women down, send us back to the 15th century, will prevail. If you think you're miserable now, just wait till the conservatives control everything. And one of the things that was so inspiring to me about Lily Ledbetter, she says, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for my daughter and my granddaughter and your granddaughter. You know, they're brave, courageous women that step up and, 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 and show us the light, you know, reflect back on us what's really happening. And you've done that for us today. Oh, well, thank Martha you. Burke, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. Remember to go out and vote. See you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.